Hi everybody. How are you doing? How are you holding up? It's a wild, strange time. Maybe you're doing great. Maybe you're loving it. Maybe you're like me and you're a little stir crazy. I'm a little stir crazy. But it's okay because we're together and we get to press into things that matter, care about each other. I was all kafutz and I was telling Evan earlier, I was all uh, mentally woke up just angry at the world, wanted to, wanted to want to argue with everybody this week, which is my general disposition in life that I have to have reformed by the Holy Spirit. Um, and uh, I woke up and, and found out that my three-year-old at 6.30 in the morning had already stolen a cookie off the counter. And suddenly, life is well and all is normal and right. Um, so I'm trying to take stock of the small gifts in my life and um, be thankful and have gratitude for the way God is um, moving and working and uh, taking care of me and, and giving me these incredible little pockets of joy and wonder. And one of the great pockets of joy I have is, um, although we're not really meeting, meeting with you here, friends, um, to be here, gathered around the good news that Jesus is going to heal the world, gathered around the good work that God has put in front of us uh, is a great um, overwhelming joy to me. So thanks for joining us this morning. I hope that you're wherever you are drawing strength and peace and patience and goodness from God. And uh, we're going to begin this morning by joining together in song. Evan is going to lead us. Let's all open up in a word of prayer. Gracious God who makes the world, sustains the world, breathes life and breath into the world. Uh, we are so thankful for your good gifts and your good work. We're thankful to be called to it. Uh, we're overwhelmed sometimes by its difficulty. Uh, but we ask, Lord, today that you invade our lives with your peace and patience, your diligence, your um, power and work at within us and uh, God we just want to join you where you are doing what you're doing and um, walking beside the, the things that you care about deeply the things that you're already at work fixing and, and proclaiming in this world and so with our time this morning we just ask that you'd be present in it gathering us together as a body in unity around uh, those things that you you want us to be gathered around, uh, strengthening us each individually where we are, and pulling us together to um, be a, an important and powerful voice for you in the world. We ask that this would be a time where you're proclaiming yourself to the world, where you're working and moving in us to do something good through us. We give ourselves, surrender all of who we are over to that work. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Evan, help us out, brother. I will. Thank you. Let's worship, Let's worship together. Me 
as I grow and as I change, may I love you more deeply. I will lean upon your grace. I will lean because you're good, you see. For living, your kindness leads me to repentance. I can't explain it, this sweet assurance. But I've never known this kind of friend. I can't explain it, this sweet assurance. I've never known this kind of friend. The sun, moon, and stars shout your name. They give you reverence, and I do the same with all my heart. I give you glory. The sun, moon, and stars shout your name. They give you reverence, and I do the same with all my heart. I give you glory. I wanna seek you first. Wanna love you more. I wanna give you the honor you deserve. So I'll bow before you, I am overcome by the beauty of this perfect love. I want to seek you first, I want to love you more, I want to give you the honor you deserve. So I'll bow before you, I am overcome. By the beauty of this perfect love. Now I am here, safety of your love. I trust your heart and your intent. Trust you complete, listening intently. You guide me through these many Oh, 
for more than conquerors we are. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the things of earth Light of his glory and grace, his word shall not fail you. He promised, believe him, and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying, his word. Salvation to tell. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Full in his wonderful faith. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his. eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strange in the light of his glory and grace. you pray with me? God, um, life is really weird right now. Uh, there's a lot of things going on in the world that, um, I don't know, I think we're both anticipated and unanticipated. And um, it's just, it's a, it's a, a weird time. I think in in everybody's light or life rather. So thank you for being the light in all of that. Uh, thank you for both being a hope, uh, something that can be strived towards, something that feels almost above it all, but also being someone who is is in here. Um, helping us through all of it, feeling it just as we are. God, we're so lucky to have such an involved, personal, compassionate, and emotional God. Um, so just thank you for, for who you are. Um, God, as, as we continue through this week, um, I pray that, uh, we would allow you to meet us where we're at, um, that we would be honest with you about what you're fe about what we're feeling, and that um, we would just feel your comforting hand on our shoulder at all times. God, it's in your son's name we pray, and we love you so much. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Evan. Appreciate it, man. Bye. Well, uh, we move on in our series today uh, called Retelling, and I just want to um, talk about a little bit why um, I got to find my document here. Gracious, where's my notes? What happened to them? Um, why we're doing this sermon series in the first place. The whole point here, friends, is we need to open our life up to perspective outside of ourself. Um, and boy, it's like it disappeared here. 
forgive me for a moment while I search my technology. I'm so excited to be doing this right now. It should be right here, and it's gone. I'm going to search for it. It's called Richard Allen. Wow, it's like my notes are gone. That is unfortunate. Hmm. Well, let's see what I remember, people. Fish, one last search. Oh, here it is. Where'd it go? Praise the Lord. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Got it. Here I am. <laughs> uh, all right. So uh, we talked a little bit about Paul. And we talked about MLK. And in the, in the realm of hearing from other perspectives, um, in specifically non-white perspectives, let's just be honest, uh, MLK is the low-hanging fruit on the tree. Uh, and so what I want to today do today is I want to get a little bit deeper into the history of um, of the black church in America. And, um, you know, the truth is that most of that isn't part of our historical knowledge, even for those of us who have studied Christian history. Uh, you know, we, we study uh, Eurocentric history. That's the, the, the history we learn about in school. That's the history that's in our textbook. And so I wanted to get deeper because I think that the more we uh, understand the, the story and the history of people outside of our own kind of Eurocentric vision, the more we're going to understand um, what it means to be an ally, to be a co-conspirator in the gospel now. And so I just think it's really important that we dig up and and own that this is American history, this is Christian history, this is our history in the sense that we are Christians and Americans, even though it's a piece that we've never been told and we never heard. And so I wanted to start right at the roots of um, of the black church in America, and, and it really kicks off. You can't really study history without studying the characters of history, and I think um, Bishop Richard Allen is one of the first and foremost characters that really kicks off the black m movement of churches and, and faith in America. Um, and obviously we don't have time to like go into all kinds of history this morning, but just a brief sketch here. Um, Bishop Richard Allen was not always a bishop. He was born into slavery in Delaware in 1790. And uh, as a slave, his, his non-Christian master encouraged him to go to church where he, um, he, you know, became part of the Methodist revival movement in America, um, you know, the Great Awakening, as it's sometimes known. Um, and he, you know, he came to Christ and he immediately started learning and even uh, teaching and preaching in the church. And um, his master later went to a... Um, you know, a revival from one of the circuit riding preachers and um, was converted. And part of that conversion, he was convicted that slavery was wrong, at least convicted enough that he offered his slaves an opportunity to buy their freedom. Um, and so Richard Allen was able to work and become a freed um, black man in uh, the 17, late 1700s in America, uh, and he moved to Philadelphia. He became a powerful preacher, and instead of doing what many preachers were doing, which was touring, circuit riding, as they called it, he went to a black hub of freed black people in Philadelphia, and he started preaching in the Methodist Church, um, or in what would become the Methodist Church, but he was relegated to preaching in the 5 a.m. service. You know, yeah, you can preach, but only in the morning. And of course, um, black people start showing up for this, like really start gathering to hear this guy preach. Uh, but he always resented the way that the services were segregated and the authority of white people over him. 
And so he eventually branched out to make a congregation of his own. And still, uh, you know, he was branching out under the Methodist movement. Um, but, you know, they had to have a white pastor or a white priest come and give communion in this all-black congregation. And um, eventually they bought land and raised money. For nearly a decade they raised money and they built a church, which is now what's known as Mother Bethel, African Methodist Episcopal Church in downtown Philadelphia. It's the oldest parcel of real estate owned in America, continuously owned by black people. So, you know, this is in 1794 they, they founded that church. By 1813, this church had 1,200 plus members. So you got to think this is, uh, at the time, the biggest equivalent of a mega church. Um, and this mega church with all these people gathering at it for a long time was still under white control, white leadership, and it had to do whatever you know the the white um, polity said it had to do. So eventually, the need came to just be free and to form um, its own denomination. And in 1816, um, this church bonded together with five other black churches and formed what is the African Methodist Episcopal Church, um, African in that they were mostly black, Methodist and it was part of the Methodist movement, Episcopal in that they followed the Episcopal form of government with a bishop presiding over churches. And today the AME Church has a worldwide membership of about two and a half million. It's the largest predominantly African American denomination in the U.S. Um, and, you know, they've owned that church <clears throat> since 1794. They've owned the land. Um, so this is a, a hallmark, landmark place in the world that's really the first. It's one of, if not the first, official institutions owned and run by African Americans in the United States. It's really like the, the first wave of free black people starting to own things and run things and organize. And this is a slave who became an entrepreneur and organizer and a powerful preacher. And as I read and learned about Richard Allen, one of the things that was most accessible to read about was actually the division that he had in and amongst himself and his um, his friends, and his, especially his co-conspirator, Absalom Jones. They founded a free Af what was called the Free African Society, the FAS, um, and it was a, an organization meant to help fugitive slaves and immigrants to the city. And eventually, FAS would become an important part of the Underground Railroad. And they had this split right from the beginning, uh, and eventually split off into separate ways, and the split was about what kind of church do we form, who do we organize under. And you have to understand the Methodist movement is brand new, right? Uh, you know, John Wesley dies in 1791, Charles in 1788. They're the founders of the Methodist movement. Um, and the Methodist movement is all about having this relationship with God, right? Um, and the Absalom Jones and uh, and a lot of the churches underneath him and, and followers underneath him, they choose to affiliate with the Episcopal Church in America because they've been Anglicans, Church of England folk, for so long. And the Methodist movement, which was about this relational, spirit-led uh, life uh, with Jesus, was you know it was it was born out of this revival movement um, and was sort of um, separating itself from the dogmatic religion of the Church of England was new, and there was this immediate split. And this divide was a really pressing issue. And one of the the, the things that there, the, the pressure was on was the pressure to assimilate to a white way of doing church. The pressure to assimilate to the tradition of the Anglican English church with its liturgy and structure and institutional respectability or the freedom to worship in new ways and have your own thing. And so I wanted to share with you a hymn, a poem um, called Spiritual Song that was writ written by Bishop Richard Allen, the first bishop of the AME Church, um, that illustrates this divide very clearly. Um, 
and I'm, I'm in debt to a scholar here from Azusa, which I'll, I'll quote him a little bit later here. But I just want to share some of the lyrics from this poem. And the way this works is it's coming in two stanzas. There's, these, there's this conversation. you got to think about it. It's almost like Pilgrim's Progress, right? Like there's uh, a speaker, and then there's the pilgrim, and they're having this conversation back and forth. Um, so let me pull it up here. Actually have it going on. Oh, here, I'm just going to share this. And then we're going to switch programs and going to switch programs. Here we go. And then, um, so here is the first stanza of this poem. Good morning, brother pilgrim. What marching to Zion? What doubts and what dangers have you met today? Have you found a blessing? Are your joys increasing? Press forward, my brother, and make no delay. Is your heart a-glowing? Are your comforts a-flowing? And feel you an evidence now bright and clear. Feel you a desire that burns like a fire and longs for the hour that Christ shall appear. And Brother Pilgrim answers back, I came out this morning and now I'm returning, perhaps little better than when I first came. Such groaning and shouting, it sets me to doubting. I fear such religion is only a dream. The preachers were stamping, the people were jumping, and screaming so loud that I neither could hear, either praying or preaching, such horrible screeching. T'was truly offensive to all who were there. This is a, a, a pilgrim who's come into a black church and is saying, like, look, this isn't real religion. These people are having a, a, a Pentecostal moment. This is what we would describe, right, uh, as that. And he's like, you can't focus on God with all that. Here's Richard Allen's response. Perhaps, my dear brother, while they prayed together, he sat and considered and prayed not at all. Would you find a blessing? Then pray without ceasing. Obey the command that was given by Paul. For if you should reason at any such season, no wonder if Satan should tell in your ears, the preachers and people, they are but a rabble, and this is no place for reflection and prayers. And the pilgrim answers, no place for reflection, I'm filled with distraction. I wonder what people could bear for to stay. The men, they were bawling, the women were squalling. I know not for my part how any could pray. Such horrid confusion, if this be religion, sure tis something new that never was seen. For the sacred pages that speak of all ages does nowhere declare that ever such has been. This poem goes on for a few more stanzas, and, uh, and eventually uh, you see Richard Allen defending um, what is the new sort of um, culturally black way of worshiping. Saying like, look, God is here and God is in this. And maybe you need to stop uh, and think that, that God is really working here. And eventually um, the pilgrim comes to Jesus. <laughs> Big shot. Um, but there's this tension here. And the tension is between ordered theological worship and the spirit-filled revival kind of worship that we associate with Pentecostalism. And indeed, this movement, this Methodist movement, would arguably be the birthplace of the Pentecostal movement. Freed slaves, and they're singing, not in the staid and steady hymns of the Anglican tradition, not following just the Book of Common Prayer, but they're singing spirituals born of the fields where they came laced with the tradition of African song, dancing and singing and shouting. And this, pers this tension persisted on into the AME history. Daniel Alexander Payne, um, who became the fifth, or excuse me, sixth bishop of the AME, he was a highly educated Lutheran Presbyterian, and he said, uh, here's a quote, um, I have mentioned the praying and singing band elsewhere. After the sermon, they, are, they formed a ring, and with coats off sung, clapped their hands, and stamped their feet in a most ridiculous and heathenish way. Among some songs, I find what are known as, quote, cornfield ditties. I suppose that with the most stupid and headstrong is an incurable religious disease. The time is at hand when the ministry of the AME Church must drive out this heathenish mode of worship, or drive out all of intelligence, refinement, and practical Christians who may be in her bosom. This is a black man saying that. 
But I want to just point out here, there's this pressure to assimilate. And this is, my friends, one of the most subversive ways um, that the white church has been part and parcel to systemic racism. This is the part, this is the theological training of the institutional church. We don't see local cultural worship as authentic unless it meets our standard, unless it looks like our worship, has the text of our worship, has the education of our pastors. Then it's legit. But if it's full of the cornfield ditty, well, then it's ignorant. The tension between the smart, composed, academic religion and the spirit-filled, wanton, ecstatic, experiential worship is as real today as it ever has been. Uh, I, this, a lot of this is coming from an essay by Kenneth Waters, who's a uh, professor from Azusa. And, uh, and he, he quotes Martin Luther King and brings this whole question right into the present. Um, this is a Martin Luther King. One of the most, this is the quote from his, his uh, essay. One of the most arresting asides to the debate was made by late great Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in his sermon on Luke 11, 5 through 6, entitled A Knock at Midnight, where he speaks of two kinds of black churches that, quote, feed no midnight traveler, i.e., that fall short of having a vital ministry. According to Dr. King, one burns with emotionalism and the other freezes with classism. The former, reducing its worship to entertainment, places more emphasis on volume than on content and confuses spirituality with muscularity. The danger in such a church is that members may have more religion in their hands and feet than in their hearts and souls. The other type of black church that feeds no midnight traveler has developed a class system and boasts of its dignity, its membership of professional people, and its exclusiveness. In such a church, the worship is cold and meaningless, the music dull and uninspiring, and the sermon little more than a homily on current events. If the pastor says too much about Jesus Christ, the members feel that he is robbing the pulpit of dignity. If the choir sings a Negro spiritual, the members claim an affront to their class status. I just want to point out here that the history of the black church is laced with the question, do we have to assimilate to be vital? And there's this fight right from the beginning to be both an authentic, organic expression of worship and to live in a society that has set the bar for what is respectable and what isn't. And I think the contemporary question for us as we wrestle with that history, or at least one of them, um, is do we feed the midnight traveler, as Dr. King would put it? We don't want to be a church that feeds no midnight traveler. Are we so woke and so educated and so enlightened that we can't connect with real experience? Can we be vital and also be learned and have depth and education? Can we worship and learn and be moved to justice? I mean, you guys know that, uh, that I, uh, you know, I often get criticized for you know, being too historical or too theological or too much of a nerd or whatever. Um, but you know, I, I don't know if you knew this, but I got a little Pentecostal streak in me and I have to hold those things in tension. And I want to ask, do we need others to have our same experience of faith and tradition and values, our same cultural expression, in order for us to hear them? And not just in worship, in everything. One of the reasons why we don't connect, one of the barriers with the marginalized, the minority, and the oppressed is because they come from somewhere different, they speak differently, they dress differently, they worship differently, they have different cultural priorities. And this is a pressing question which I propose that our congregation exists to answer, and that's, can we hear people other than ourselves? Or do we exist in an echo chamber of our own ideas? And of course we say, yes, we, don't want, we want to hear other people than ourselves, but it gets really difficult when people other than ourselves uh, challenge our sense of right and just. 
It's hard work. It's difficult work. And so we have to build into our daily, weekly practice the ritual and the uh, desire to be fed by people from outside of our own sphere of influence. To do hard work, to listen and open our eyes and our hearts to other people. We have to learn their history. We may have to put ourselves in uncomfortable situations and learn their custom, learn their singing, learn their, their politics. It's not easy work. It's uncomfortable work. And we need to be putting ourselves in a situation where we're willing to be uncomfortable and to not have all the answers and to know. And there's a tension there because we also have things that we know deeply and we want to fight and, and, uh, and advocate for those things that we know deeply. But we have to hold even the things that we know deepest. We have to hold and say, maybe I'm wrong about that. Which is a difficult thing to do. Um, ultimately, can we accept others who are different than us? And can we accept ourselves? And are we willing and allowing ourselves to be changed? That's the question. Um, I think the pressure on the African American church to conform to American Western white cultural ideals was on right from the beginning. And, you know, we haven't, you know, for those of you who worshiped with us when we were at Stepping Stone, there's an AME church right across the street. And guaranteed their worship looked different than ours. And I want to ask, like, would any of us have been comfortable to walk into that church and worship? And I think if we're honest, we'd say, no, we weren't, wouldn't be. Um, and we have to ask ourselves, are we willing to, to put ourselves in uncomfortable situations so that we can be changed and humbled and moved? Let's build that into our daily practice, friends, as we seek to be formed and transformed into the likeness of Jesus. Um, and I think ultimately the resource that will help us do that is um, the Holy Spirit. Um, we have to let God move and transform our heart. The Holy Spirit is the, the powerful tool which will move and transform us from the inside out. Um, we have to let ourselves be wrecked and remade by God from our heart out. Uh, I was singing my kids to sleep last night and I sang them a song that I've sung so many hundreds of times to them. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. With thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. And I sat in that room in the dark, and I thought to myself, am I willing to be emptied so that I can be a dwelling place for the Spirit of God to move? so that I can be changed and remade, broken and built up in the image of God, which when you're made and remade in the image of God, friends, um, it often is not gonna look like you. It's gonna look like the diverse, wonderful mosaic of the world that we live in. And so I wanna part by singing together or singing over you if you prefer um, this song and asking ourselves and our congregation 
Are we willing to be emptied to become a dwelling place for God to make and reshape us? Or are we asking everybody to be like us? Let me pray this over you. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary pure and holy to right and true with thanksgiving I'll be a living sanctuary for you friends go in peace love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.